la la oh la la oh <laughs> Hello, my beautiful audience. Welcome to another episode of Pop Talk. I'm Cody McDonald, and I'm here with Josh Weinberg. Hello. Oh, I got the baritone. I've, I've wanted Falsetto, sometimes, yeah. baritone. I've wondered sometimes <laughs> if I'm actually more of a lower bass, but I also am very nitpicky my voice in general, so I'm very proud of that. Hey, well... We're okay. Every time we hear our voices for the first time on anything, we kind of cringe just a little bit, you know? <laughs> and some a little more. Yeah. Uh, wow, this is the first time we've done like a solo one-on-one on Pop Talk. Yeah, yeah. What took you so long exactly? I, I had a horrible schedule. <laughs> yeah, he says that all the time. <laughs> yeah, last time we were talking about Pink Floyd, Lyle, and uh, geez, all, like all the time we're talking about like albums and all that. We've done that to death. We still are going. We'll probably do another one uh, after this comes out. So many. I don't Maybe even we'll know. do another tier list in the future, too. I think I got one more left in me after the one we're just about to do. I forget when this is coming out compared to the, the volumes, volume six or seven, whatever, which one we're on. <laughs> but, and then you also did the, like, you did the, uh, the band experience with Lyle as well. Yeah, that was, that was a fun one. Although I, I, I mean, I will say in hindsight, I do think I could have elaborated a little more i could have put a bit more in there yeah but it was good to get some of it out it felt a bit therapeutic in a way well what i'm alluding to is that clearly you are very passionate with music and i am as well but we haven't really talked strongly about like live concert experiences well i mean for most people up until probably the last six to eight months that was kind of a hard sell for various reasons various reasons yeah i'm a little squeamish about the idea going back unless it's outside unless it's outside but we'll we'll see how you know the mandates and all that will well there's not really any mandates right now but it's just about comfortable there's certain rules in place yeah but most of it's about personal comfort the the comfort level is like still there but but yeah let's just uh what was your very first concert Oh my god, my very first. See, that's where I can't remember exactly which one. I would probably be a little generic and say it might have been something, something, Sharon Lewis and Bram, something, something, uh, Dark Side, Raffi. <laughs> or I do remember when I was seven, I used to have a program for this, but I think I sold it in a garage sale about four years ago. I don't know if it counts necessarily, but uh, when the live show Barney's Big Surprise came to the Rogers Center, uh, formerly known as Sky Dome, yeah. uh, this was 1999, I saw that, uh, I think the four of us saw that, so my parents, my sister and me, that's kind of like a musical show kind of thing. It wasn't a proper concert, but it's one of the earliest memories I have of actually seeing something live. 99? Wow, that predates me. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> unless you count watching uh, Barney live in New York City when I was a younger kid. Mm-hmm. That was from like 94, so... I, I got into the actual concert concert viewing game pretty late in life. Well, like late teens, let's say. Me too, yeah. Like I had... I mean, I went to more plays growing up, and I guess you oh, can yeah. kind of count that as, like, you know, live I was performances. I going to say, like, plays, but, Broadway yeah. musicals, is that... I mean, I, I wouldn't fully count Broadway musicals, but I have to We won't so count that. Those. We'll just count, like, you know, live performances of, like, bands and, like, artists and all that. Like, I, I, I've i mentioned this before. I don't know if you, if you do or if you are aware of this, but uh, my very first concert in 2007 in between the summer of grade school and high school was none other than then... None other than, sorry, none other than the uh, famous band Nickelback, Canadian's cherished band, along uh, with... Yes, uh, rich in vitamins and minerals and uh, swiftiness. Oh, man. So I was uh, bike riding with my papa on the Ganatro Trail in Windsor and had a nice time with him. And as we were putting the bikes away in his trunk, my parents just pull up next to us out of nowhere and was like hey we won some tickets to see nickelback in the states i think it was like one of those like you know radio whatever it was oh, okay. i was like oh cool and then, of course like i was into nickelback at the time 13 14 whatever like it, it was like yeah of course so we went over to the joe lewis arena over the border uh, rest in peace yeah it's now not it's around anymore Caesars. yeah yeah it's not around anymore i wonder if they do serve you crazy bread with every concert <laughs> that's another thing i did go to a vip uh um, it was actually funny enough. The last time I was in the states in 2013 of March 
was when I went to the Little Caesars uh, VIP of this hockey game. It was the same, the oh. CEO of, uh, wow, of that's Little cool. Caesars. And it was some college team that was playing another college team. And we were up on the mezzanine and it was the CEO there. And he had like pizza, pizza and wings out for as far as you can see. Wow. Very fun. Last time I was in the States, actually. Funny enough. So but this was in Detroit. It was in Detroit. Uh, when we got there, I didn't even know like... Oh, we're just we're gonna see them right away. But as we got there, I didn't know that Chris Daughtry and Stained was opening up for Nickelback. Kind of a mixed bag of yeah. opening choices, but again, late two thousands radio rock. We we missed Daughtry. I mean, I guess I wasn't missing much. Here's, here's the hot take. N- nice, nice titled Daughtry album. Not that bad. Nice not, voice. Not that bad. Yeah, home, nice, yeah. home, and oh yeah. I would yeah. say what I want and there and back again are actually that's another tangent, but. First, a self-titled Dr. album, not that bad, but his voice isn't suited for, like, the harder edge stuff. His voice much. is good on its own. Like, I remember in the American Idol days, that's where he came from. But, like, doing post-grunge kind of stuff is a little bit of a clash. We missed that, but we caught the middle of Stained. I remember they played some songs off of their Open the Eyes album, uh, Fade, and the really good one, Epiphany. That's, like, when Aaron Lewis has the acoustic guitar and he sings his voice out. And I think they played Mud Shovel. Well, they kind of have to. I mean, yeah, before, pre yeah. Break the Cycle, that's really like the only notable song. Not Open Your Eyes, Break the Cycle. That's the One album. Yeah. It's a shame I didn't hear. Uh, it's been a while. Good. Yeah. I didn't have to make the joke. No. <laughs> uh, but then, like. I've never been big into Stain, though, myself. For, there's, there's better new metal out there, for sure. Yeah, they're, they're, they kind of got a little poppy later on. Just ish. Radio friendly. Yeah, pop, yeah. Is This It was a thing the yeah. next year. I remember that being a thing. Right here waiting. That's another song. Wait, they covered Richard Marx. <laughs> Zoe, uh, Zoe Jane was another song I remembered. It was like popish, but yeah, when funny. Nickelback, like when they opened, okay, so the whole room goes dark. I'm just hearing like this drum beat. Sounds like the kick pedal of a drum keeps going and going and going and going. And all of a sudden, I just hear this loud gunshot. Like it's just like this <laughs> whole crowd's losing it. Like and all of a sudden, out of nowhere lights are on the tv is showing the all the right reasons car in full motion yep. speeding down the yeah, highway that makes sense. they open with animals da, 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 da. and it's just out of nowhere and we're just like yeah like this is great and i will admit they can put on a show yeah. say what you want about them they can put they're, on a show they're pretty solid live i mean the I, pyrotechnics the freaking like everything like not so subtle plug i'm using the wonderful website setlist.fm to take a look at the particular set list which i'm doing for most of them can i guess can i guess what the encores uh, were can i guess what the encores sure. were okay was the, were the encores figure figured you out and how you remind me 50 50 it was rock star and then figured you out but Rockstar. yeah seeing animals i mean here's the thing as much as all the right reasons got a lot of well not so great reviews just because of how safe and mainstream it sounded Animals does go pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and not released as a single either. That's funny enough. Well, I'm guessing for certain lyrically related <laughs> reasons, of course not. Yeah, yeah. But um, of course you have the big ones in there that was photographed. Because of you, I would honestly say because of you is one of, if not the heaviest Nickelback songs that Hell they yeah. had put out until Feed the Machine, but that was years later. Yeah, yeah. Let's let, let's save all this for Evan because I think he wants to talk about all the right reasons. Yeah, I'm seeing here they covered Feed the Machine, Sat- I think. I'm I seeing here they covered Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. They did that with Kid Rock. Yeah. And I'm sad now. Yeah, they did that with Kid Rock. Yeah. Um, a lot of these are kind of... it's That's the thing. I don't mind Nickelback, but there's a, there's a distinguishing f- uh, factor here between bands that I don't mind listening to on record versus which ones would I actually be willing to go and see live and yeah. not just watch the videos afterwards on YouTube. But Nickelback are not one of those bands. Well, I knew so much about them already, but I, and it's something I want to ask you when you uh, when we talk more about like experiences, but do you have like... When you saw a band live and they play all these songs was there a song that they play like they have that you were kind of like eh on before but after you see them play it live you love the song afterwards um i'd have to remember i'd have to take a bit to think about that i think so this, this is skipping ahead a little but there was a band i saw in 2018 with marnie a little junior they had just put out their debut record at the time it was a uh, high which was pretty good, but it was sort of like power pop mixed with indie rock. I think there was a song, Buzz Off, that I list- I didn't mind it on the record, huh? but I think once I actually saw it live, it connected with me a bit more. 
But then again, I also kind of. But did you appreciate the song afterwards? I think a little I did. Bit more? Yeah, you went back to it. Yeah, and it kind sounded of, it yeah. sounded better live. But then again, they also did a really solid cover of Carly Rae Jepsen's "I Really Like You," cool. which they were kind of getting known for. Oh, I really, 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 really like you. Yeah, man. but the, and they had a music video where basically it's um it's uh, Annie Murphy from Schitt's Creek. She's sort of dressed up in the sort of Tom Hanks esque outfit, much like the original video was. But that was that was at the Garrison downtown. That was pretty good. It was one of the, I think it was the first uh, thing Marnie and I went to, like the first show we went to. But what well, this is a more of a pet peeve with me. I really don't like a lot of flashing lights in general. Anything strobe related, anything. I just I fi- personally I find it unnecessary. I understand why lighting sets ha- have them, mm-hmm. but I kind of wish that lighting could be a little bit more accessible, and you don't need to have that intensity going. You find that it takes away from the experience. It kind of does also, yeah. just because like. I'm, I don't know if it's a light sensitivity thing that we have or that I have or just it feels a little bit extra, but it, w- it was a good enough show. I guess I'm just, I have to sometimes ease myself into that, but it was kind of neat. There was a little bit of a, not a mosh pit going on per se, but there was a little bit of a gentle shoving. Oh, and, I've never been involved in those. <laughs> well, I don't I don't see a lot of heavy stuff either, no, but I, mean, I like yeah. heavy music, but mm-hmm. I don't think I would see a lot of it live just because of that factor. Although obviously I know mosh pits aren't for everybody, but there's a lot of community stuff like in extreme music there's a lot of like a general sense of community like it's it's always been a cardinal rule of mosh pits when someone falls you pick them up oh for sure that, that goes without saying but um but what i was gonna say about nickelback when i when i saw them there was one song that i was kind of like not that i i'm saying i was on the fence about it before i just hadn't listened to it that much but when they played it live and at this point it was kind of a deep cut but it was uh woke up this morning and I was like right near the beginning. It was off of Silver Side Up. And I, I, I know I of the song. I just yeah. haven't heard it. So. No wonder why I had my love from you some days. You, I felt like shit when I woke up this morning. Oh, don't da-na-na. drink. Da-na-na. Just just be sober and you'll be fine. <laughs> that that song was so good live. And afterwards, I just remember like the melody, the hook of that song like kind of stuck with me a bit. And when I went back to the, al- the album, I was like, oh, yeah, it's that song that I really got into. And that was an example of like after I saw it live, it got me into it. And I know I'm gonna I'm gonna get into more examples with other concerts where that happened oh, again. I bet you will. Where like all of a sudden their live performance just got me into a song that I wasn't normally into beforehand. Um, other than that, the Nickelback. I remember Daniel Adair, did, the drummer, who's actually not a bad drummer. He did a solo uh, drum. He did yeah, a drum, drum solo. solo. He did a drum solo, and afterwards, I remember Chad Kroger going, "Give it up for Daniel Adair," and he goes. AKA Mr. December and it cut, cuts to Daniel on the TV and he's like, come on, stop. And I'm like, uh, inside joke. Yay. I don't get it, but it's always stuck with me. Uh, that little yeah, see, exchange. I don't, I don't miss know that where the, the, the front man guy makes a joke that he thinks is funny, but nobody else finds funny. This is Chad Kroger's persona. All right. This next album, this next song is off a little album called, uh, the long road. And if you know the lyrics, please sing along. It's called someday. It's like, yes, everyone here knows these fucking songs, Chad. You don't need to have this introduction and, like, ruin the impact. Just start playing the song and people will start cheering, you know? Goddamn, just constructive criticism, Mr. Kroger. (laughs) You know, for a 15-year-old concert. I mean, the guy probably takes so much criticism already, but whatever. Um, Yeah, that's, like, the very first concert. Got, Got a shirt. Too had the whole uh, tour on the back of the shirt, that whole yeah, thing. Things, yeah, 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 yeah. Like that. Yeah. Uh, That's interesting though. So, like, in your opinion, like when because I don't think you went to too many, you know, cross border shows. But like, what did you feel like the crowd? What it's like compared to a show here? Uh, well, after Nickelback, it wasn't until like a couple of years later where uh, a girlfriend of mine at the time, and this was right at the tail end of high school, we went to Pine Knob in the states. It was like this kind of like outside hill and at the bottom it was like the stage and we saw uh we were seeing journey right because she was really big into 80s hair metal bands and all that and i was i guess to a certain extent i mean from windsor it's like you're gonna hear that shit a lot on the radio i've mentioned that before uh foreigner opened up for them I don't remember much from Foreigner other than playing Hot Blooded, to be honest. Well, but it would have been like what feels like the first time, Head Games, Jukebox Hero. I want to know what Love is. You know what? I think they played. Ju- I like, think they played Jukebox for, Hero. Yeah. Now that I think of it, Double Vision. Uh, it's weird that I missed. I want to know what Love is. No, I don't remember them playing that. Um, it's weird. Both uh, when I saw Nickelback, I saw a little bit of Stain, then I saw a little bit of Foreigner. That's funny. Um, but to, to but I know I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. I'll get to your answer 
um when i saw a foreigner or sorry when i saw a journey it was just around the time like they had that new guy like steve perry oh, yeah, wasn't yeah. in the band no it would have um, been yeah it was like right after arnel Pineda joined yeah and i and, remember that being a big deal at the time you know not a bad choice and it was of course kind of cool to see uh, i remember faithfully really stuck with me and at the time you know you're with your significant other you know either that or open arms is yeah, gonna I was gonna stick say with open you arms yeah or was patiently i don't know if they played oh, that faithfully one. patiently patiently i don't think i know that one here I stand so patiently. I'm only familiar with Frontiers and uh, what's okay. the one that came before? So the before? Jonathan Cain era. Yeah, well, what's the one that came right oh, before? Escape and Frontiers. Escape, Escape, Escape and Frontiers. Escape and Don't Stop Believing yep. and Stone and Love and Who's Crying Now. Separate Ways. You know, Frontiers yeah. is separate ways. Separate Ways, yeah. yeah. Um, I also still really think you should consider going back to like the Steve Perry days, but even like the pre-Steve Perry stuff, like when they were a quartet that did like a bit more heavier stuff almost like borderline prog there's some good stuff on there but um i think you would have also probably heard like wheel in the sky any way you want it yep yeah i i I probably touch and squeezing you know i probably heard all this i was probably just so distracted by like by how beautiful she was no by how it was kind of rough with us at the time like my parents got us that those tickets and it was just kind of like you know we were kind of going through a bit of like a you know, I kept asking, are you okay? You okay? She kind of seemed a little distant and I'm trying to enjoy the show, but it was, oh, she it was, was kind of like, in her head. but to compare like that, to answer your question, to compare like, kind of like, you know, a Detroit outside venue to like an outside venue in Toronto. The first like outside venue concert that I saw in Toronto was, uh, at the Budweiser stage. It was, uh, Vance Joy. Oh, yes. Which was a, f- a phase. guy. It was a phase. Yeah, like was I, a 2010s phase for Ver- a lot of us. Ver- Veronica and I kind of went through a little phase in 2018. This was after he did I the, mean, his you, second you album. Do, you do work in a, in a Starbucks. <laughs> so it does kind of make sense that that sort of coffee shop ukulele music would appeal to you in some way. Yeah, kind of, sort of. But like, I don't know. I mean, I, I liked a lot of stuff off of that first album that he did, like Georgia and, you know... Riptide and I just, I know Fire Riptide in the Flood. And Fire in the Flood because it yeah. would play on the radio. And I heard Missing Piece a little bit recently. Missing Piece. That's a more, it's a newer song. But, but he, was th- this was during his tour on his like his newest album at that time that oh. had like Summer, Saturday Sun and stuff like that. Um, it was not a bad show. For, I, got, I got Veronica because both Veronica and I went. Uh, I got her the sweater there. It's the most expensive sweater I ever spent, and it's ugly too. But it was a cold I'm like, night. Yo, that's fifty dollars for a sweater. Yeah, no, it was seventy dollars, maybe eighty with tax. I don't even remember. It was horribly expensive, and it was a cr- really pukey colored green looking sweater with the, the the I think it was alone with me was the I feel like there's the, t- a bit the title of irony of in that. And um, it was kind of strange where it's like we're both sit. I think what I think what it was is that like I liked the idea of sitting on a hill watching a concert and we got to choose our spots. Here at Budweiser Stage, it was assigned seating, and if everyone's standing up, oh, I guess I better stand up off my seat. But it was really, it was giving me kind of church vibes. It's like sit, stand, sit, no, no, stand. No, no. If, oh. no, if you were going to see Hosier, then it would have been church vibes. At that time. <laughs> but um, it was not bad of a concert. I remember he was very charismatic, Vance Joy, and he was very like humbled and uh there's a couple like ballad parts where we're all taking out our phones like it was nice and i think the band actually funny enough the band that played right before them was this little band that i kind of got into a little bit uh mondo cosmo can't say i've heard of them oh i recommend them actually you probably heard one of their songs off of like a fifa like soccer game that's called play automatic any, uh, fifa games oh i thought you do okay never mind no i play other sports games uh, like that. yeah it's funny they <laughs> They're they're like a rock band, but the singer sounds exactly like Bob Dylan, like verbatim. Their song, uh, I forget how it goes. It's like "Let Him Get High, Let Him Get Stoned." It, it the the chorus of that song sounds like "Change" by Blind Melon. You play both of those back to back, they sound exactly the same. Oh yeah, it's like I if "Change" that. is it's like if "Change" is covered by Bob Dylan. It's kind of funny. So I got a little bit into these guys afterwards. Um, trying to think uh my very first concert in toronto and then i'll let you have it um, i was gonna say you yeah gonna show those so i'm you. rambling no sorry my very first concert in toronto actually was uh 
uh, when I was in film school, I did a music video. One of our projects was to find like a band. So we found like this really local band called Shout Out to the Annie Queens. I don't know if you're still around. Oh, the Annie Queens? I know. They're pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Actually, this is as a side. Uh, yeah. Someone I, I uh, initially met through, she was doing a bunch, like her own solo project. She was the bass player there for a couple of years. I, I was working in the library at the time, and this is like right as she was joining, but they've got some some good stuff there yeah. but it was kind of cool to see them actually go from like smaller band to now they're on stomp records and they're doing well for themselves so shout out to them yeah absolutely they have like kind of like a paramore garbage kind of vibe to them yeah I can... um they, i remember when i saw them live it was a very small venue this was after we did the music video with them which... so how long ago did you say this was roughly uh would have had to have been mid late twenty ten, like mid twenty ten. Twenty thirteen. Yeah, this was about yeah. four years before. They released an EP at the time, which had one of the songs that we did. It was actually uh, an acoustic, uh, softer, melodic song that we did the song we did the music video for. I forget the name of the song, um, but when we saw them live, it was like, just at a very small venue. It was at a bar, and we were like front row. Like there was us and probably twenty other people. Like it was very small. But it was just kind of neat and cool to see them, like people that we worked with, and to see them in their full f fruition, you know? And yeah, it's really nice when you're able to like see people actually achieve their full potential. And like, yeah. you're seeing a band basically break out before your eyes. Yeah, yeah. It, it was nice. They recognized us afterwards when we said hey to them. Yeah. I will allow you to take the reins. Hooray. Please. Okay, so, <laughs> Please lay them on me. Lay them um, on me. Now, in terms of the first actual proper concert that I remember and that... I mean, I'm really grateful I got to see this band more than once, was uh, seeing Rush twice in uh, with a span of like 18 oh, months. wow. And, and when Neil Peart was still around, rest yeah, in peace. Um, well, I mean, I, I was going to come to this later, but one of my biggest regrets is not going to see them on the R40 tour, because that would have been their last tour, and I, I feel like in hindsight, I should have finished the job mm -hmm. and seen them a third time, especially if it was going to be, the had I known it was going to be the last time, but... Yeah. I saw them in April of 2011 at a Cops Coliseum in Hamilton with my family for oh, the yeah. Time Machine tour, and that was fun. They did uh, two different sets. Uh, the first set actually had some songs that, uh, in hindsight, so you were talking about songs that I didn't know very well at the time, but then I heard it live and it grew on me. Mm -hmm. Time Stand Still. Time Stand Still. That's a song, granted it's from a record, Hold Your Fire, that is a little bit more of a, not a little bit poppier, but it's got more... Not as strong a synth tone as records like, obviously, Signals, Grace Under Pressure, Power Windows, things like that. But once I heard it live, I appreciated it more as a result. Because I now, it's one of my favorite Rush songs. Uh, I also really enjoyed hearing us stick it out. And they played some stuff that would have eventually been on Clockwork Angels, which came out the following year. I also loved they closed the first uh, half of that with Subdivisions, which is, again, one of my favorite Rush songs. The second set was they performed Moving Pictures in its entirety because it, it, it turned 30 that year. I, that's the one that you... Uh, is, is that the album that you were No, I, I covered Grace Under Pressure Grace in Under our Pressure. episode, but everyone yeah. knows Moving Pictures. To hear such a seminal record live like that, and they also had some really neat visuals like in between. I think there were some movies they play on the screen. Did you say that, that they... Fun. Did they play some songs off of... Um... Grace Under Pressure? Grace Under Pressure? Or? I'm just going to check here. I don't think they did. Oh. Uh, I don't believe so. No, they didn't. Also, yeah, and they, they played Free Will in the first half as well. Free Will's great. Um, and then Neil Peart, Neil Peart did his Love for Sale drum solo. That was fun. Like, mixing in not only the regular drum parts, but, like, electronic drums, oh, and the little bits of samples of Big Band. That was really fun. The fact cool. that you saw him do a drum solo, yeah, I am jealous. I had only started playing drums a couple years earlier, and that was just like... I mean, I knew I was never going to be as good as him. Your but mind just, was blown. Yeah, you and felt getting to see like... him more than once was amazing. Oh, man. And the fact that, like, my, my, all my family got to understand why i love this band as much as i do and then the, the encore was la via stronciato which also blew my mind i don't so, know if it was a full nine minute version of it but it's just so when did you see them the second time um well after they they closed with working man that day with like a reggae version i saw them with my dad at the scotia bank arena the oh. following october for the clockwork angels tour which they had an orchestra like a string section with them oh. and that that that'll come and come back in another artist but it was really cool so they played um they actually played a few other, other interesting things. They had, um, well, they played Subdivisions again. They played um, The Body Electric from Grace Under Pressure the next year. They played The Analog Kid, which is one of my favorite deeper cuts and signals. Uh, they did Where's My Thing from Roll the Bones, which uh, sort of combined with the drum solo in there. That was fun. And then the second set is the part where they actually had the string ensemble come in, and they did 
the entirety of the new record Clockwork Angels, which they played a bit of the year before, but I had already listened to it a lot. It's, I mean, it's over 10 years ago, over a decade ago at this point. Mm-hmm. And then one of my favorite parts was hearing another drum solo. It's here, Drumbastica, Drumbastica. So Headlong Flight's probably my favorite Clockwork Angels track. It's just very instrumentally demanding, but just like that drum solo is one of the one of the best Neil's ever done. And then getting to hear YYZ, on, they, I, I would have thought they would have played it last year, but YYZ bam, still bam, 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 bam. Do, do, do. Oh, man. And then they played Spirit of Radio without the string, so like you actually get to hear them rocking out. And then they did uh, sort of like a truncated version of 2112 with, uh, after Tom Sawyer as the encore, and there was some, some stuff in there. And they had a bit of the tour film was like a conceptual thing because Clockwork Angels is a concept record. And the videos actually had Jay Baruchel in there. He was oh, kind of nice. like the, the main guy. Another it, Canadian alumni. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like, I thought at the time that I, that I, and I never understood this, why did they not try and actually make a Clockwork Angels miniseries with Jay Baruchel as like this protagonist? Because it would have been neat to set the music of that record to it. But Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and I have uh, tour shirts from both of those tours. Although the uh, Time Machine tour one has seen better days. The Clockwork Angels one held up pretty well and the ironic thing was uh the night before i went to a sort of like a college party slash get together with some people from my radio program and then the, that afternoon i had band practice for my old band it was kind of weird it was a lot of social activities at once for me hmm. but it was a lot of fun and uh i just wish i had done it a third time but i got the the tour book the program books to go with it and i'm I'll always be grateful that I got to see a, a great band like Rush. Was that once, let alone more than once? Was that the first and maybe only band that you saw at like a huge arena? No, I've seen. Um, I know I've seen one more artist that I'll get to that, I've, that has played at uh, a bigger arena. Yeah, yeah. While we're on the topic of arenas, let me know what is it. Well, this is probably the best recent concert, but uh, it was July three years ago that Marnie and I. Finally crossed both a thing off of our bucket lists, and we saw Weird Al Yankovic. Ah, nice. On his uh, strings attached. You guys are very passionate about him. Most definitely, yeah, because I've loved Weird Al Yankovic for years, since I was probably about seven. Again, like, I remember hearing about Running With Scissors as a kid, and I've loved him ever since. And so you were saying that you, um, was it the Journey tickets or the Nickelback tickets? No, the Nickelback tickets your parents won. Yeah, they but won. But the Journey yeah. tickets were your parents uh, It was a gift. Uh, they went and did their own thing, and they bought stuff for me and my okay. girlfriend at the time. Well, I remember that uh, for the holidays that year, my parents actually got us, like Marnie and I, tickets to see Word Out. And they were good seats at Budweiser stage. Like, they were probably seven rows down. Like, they were... They weren't in the front front, but they were really close. Nice. And just, because Marty and I have loved Weird Al for a long time, and to really be able to see him together, that was like the first major thing that we did. And it was just to, to be around so many people, young and old, that, that love his music. And that's the, one of the great things about him is... Did he do another one, Rides yeah. the Bus? Uh, he did not. But ah. it was really neat to not only have the string, like the orchestra there to really add a lot more depth to those songs but there were the costume changes which were always fun so when you showed me a little bit of this concert right before recording i noticed that there was somebody doing like a star wars kind of like that was part of the i Um, think she showed you part of the warm-up where they did stuff like did some john williams uh, stuff like there was of course the uh i think the throne room part of the dark throne room yeah that was the last bit but um there was a bit of a medley with i lost on jeopardy i love rocky road and like a surgeon there was um, like a surgeon I'm familiar with. Yeah. There was Jurassic Park, which is great. Don't download this song was always fun. It's just a nice big sing along kind of number. What about the American Pie, uh, Anakin Skywalker? So yeah, the encore know? was great. So they had the sequence where a bunch of people in stormtrooper outfits are walking in, <laughs> and it does kind of feel like it's very Star Warsy. And now the band obviously does costume changes at various points for different songs. Like again, they did smells like Nirvana and. You know, we are not dressed up like Kurt Cobain. They did Dare to Be Stupid, and they all had on their Devo-esque outfits. Uh, White and Nerdy, White and Nerdy was great. Oh, I can imagine. Because that was the thing where I think one of the verses where I was, I was, I was rapping along with. Uh, did he roll on his up on a Segway? I believe he did. Have a segue for that. <laughs> I yes. love it. That's awesome. And Amish Paradise. Um, Amish Paradise. Yes. That was great. That was right yeah, before the, the Tupac encore. song. Yeah. Oh no, that's uh, or it was originally Coolio. Oh right? no, it was Coolio. What was the Tupac song that he did? I don't uh, believe there I was seen one. A, I seen it. Changes. He did one on Changes, didn't he? I'm not sure. I remember there was a parody song where it was Changes. 
Mm. Maybe I'm not. Maybe it wasn't Weird Al. I don't know. Like he introduced the band, you know, like it was a. It says here James Brown style band introduction. So I'm imagining, you know, someone putting the towel on, or maybe that's something else. But the encore was just great. You they come out and they do the Saga Begins, which is the American Pie Mm -hmm. style pair, like parody, and that was fun. And of course, they end as most Weird Al shows end with Yoda, (laughs) which is a parody of the King Slola, but. Now, up to that point, Marnie and I have been listening to a lot of Weird Al together, but that was a, it was just such a, a wonderful experience, and... I can imagine, yeah. Like, well, I enjoyed seeing Rush because they're such, they're, they're such, ah, they're great at what they do on their instruments, there we go. Weird Al is just, like, someone that I've respected and admired for a long time, just as a comedy fan in general, or at least a fan of good-natured comedy, and it was just such a fun time, like, it's... Everyone's there to have fun, and I felt like it was really worth it. And I don't always go downtown, but that was one of the times where I felt like for both of us it was worth it. And it was—it's also a, a different type of concert experience where you're not only just like you're awaiting these songs you probably expect yeah. to happen, but there's also some comedy within it. Yeah, exactly. I can imagine. It's yeah. like a full audiovisual experience, really, because yeah. you're getting the sound, you're getting the visuals, you're getting obviously the video that you see in addition to. Like I think for. Something like Fun Zone or Harvey the Wonder Hamster. There was some stuff from either the Weird Al show or, or UHF, I think, which was interesting in that, yeah, there were different segments where there'd be like, I think, the Epic Rap Battles of History video Weird Al did where oh, he was yeah. in one of those. Yeah. Like, they, they incorporated a lot of those kinds of visuals really well, but just to be around people were like, I felt like I had no problem just like singing stuff off the top of my lungs. Sometimes there's that stigma of like you don't want to be too loud. I just remember the uh, Al TV interviews that yes. they did with Eminem. I, th- I think they did use one of those. Eminem and Paul those. McCartney. Those were so funny. Those were great. And actually, after that concert, I think that's when we looked at something like Shout Factory TV because they do have the entirety of the Weird Al show from the '90s on oh, there. Oh, nice! And we had started watching some of that. But my introduction to him was actually his quick cameo in the Naked Gun. When he played himself, oh, yeah. very I, briefly. I watch that. I, I remember yeah. hearing him. He's him. in that. Oh, and uh, what's that movie? Uh, you, you, you. UHF. UHF is funny. It, it's that's funny. Really great. That's a funny movie. Um, yeah, on the topic of of arena rock kind of uh, experiences, like yeah, I mentioned before Nickelback, and then <laughs> funny enough, after I after I saw the concert and I met KJ in high school, we found out that we went to that same concert but didn't know each other. Did we just become best friends? Yep. <laughs> And we were, we were inches away from going to the All the Right Reasons 50th anniversary uh, Wait, tour. Fi- 50th? 15th. 15th. Like, I was going to say, I didn't think that car's been driving for that long. <laughs> I w- we were like, let's just do it. Let's go get drunk and have a good time. But that was in the summer of 2020, and we all know what happened then. So that did not happen. But um, my dad and I, I think this was 20, early 2012, he told me that we were going to go see Van Halen. Oh, well, that's great, but you also saw a different kind of truth there of Van Halen, which means yep. no Michael Anthony. But not to discredit Wolfgang at all. Wolfgang went on to do some good stuff, but it was cool. You know, I mean, imagine you're playing with your you're, dad, I mean, yeah, and you're playing with, playing with your uncle. David Lee Roth your, is coming back. Your second uncle. Yeah. In, 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 I, I, it would have been interesting though because yeah. I think still instrumentally they would have still been pretty solid. Yeah. Because I was I played Guitar Hero Van Halen later in high school and they were they were pretty good. So did they play any? I imagine they didn't play any Van Hagar stuff, but like no. they played most of the Mark One Van Halen you would have expected. All so what happened was my dad won. No, he didn't win any tickets. His boss gave him some tickets, right? So him did and they I went fall off a truck. <laughs> we went to the states. We saw it at the uh, Palace at Auburn Hills. Oh Which yeah, is like that, a famous that's, one. That's, yeah, that's in Detroit. And I'm thinking this is gonna be a great venue. Guess where we we were, we were side stage up on the mezzanine in wow. the sucker seats. Oh. I'm like, oh my god. But you know, regardless, even though it was kind of shit seats, seeing Van Halen come out of the gates with like, you really got me, and yeah, they played all the greatest hits. And another a time where I wasn't too big on a song or didn't even was was aware of it, but they, when they played All Wait off of uh, 1984 love that song when they played it live and then afterwards i started to recognize it more and more on the radio and funny enough after the concert every single radio station in the detroit motor city Some area it. it was just nothing but van halen van halen van halen van halen and i'm thinking to myself had we not went to this concert and i was listening to this radio station 
and all these stations, I'd be like, why are they playing nothing but Van Halen? This is so weird. What's going on? They're in cahoots, I tell you. Yeah. And in fact, our dad, my dad and I were so kind of like, let's try to see if we can get some better seats. So we ended up like going down the bleachers to like other better parts. And like some people can were kind of telling that we were trying to like sniggle our way in, you know, and they're giving us shit. And then eventually we just kind of tailed back and went to our previous seats. But regardless, David Lee Roth was on stage, had a little like like dance floor for himself. So oh, yeah, crazy, the dance path. so crazy, so just, I loved it, like, even the, the few songs off of the tour, like, the newest album that they had at the time, like, Tattoo and She's a, she's the Woman, She's the Woman is actually an outtake off of their very first album. I remember album. hearing that, I remember hearing yeah. that, because I did listen to the record, like, when it came out, it was, I was remember thinking it's okay, but I'm just, it's not quite for me. The fact that I can actually see Eddie Van Halen perform Eruption was just like I'm so yeah, happy I can those, take that. Even to... if it was like late era Van Halen Eruption live in general, oh, gotta my be God. fantastic. It, it was incredible. I'm trying to think of other noteworthy things. Oh, from how, that how concert. did they do? How did how was uh, that version of Oh Pretty Woman? Because I love the studio version. They did the intr- the, uh, the intro, intruder intro, the intruder intro. They did that. I know that. Um, they did uh, their encore. I think was Jump. Yep, it was. Yeah. Um, I, I I also like Romeo Delight from I think that's Van no that's probably one of the I forget what album's from but I like Romeo Delight. Honestly, I just remember being just like an awesome show regardless that it was probably the worst seats I've ever had at a concert at that you know ever actually at that point yeah like I don't think I've ever been to a a concert ever since that had bad seats like that but it was still a treat I got to see it with my dad my dad and I are really big fans of like heavier music and. Uh, yeah, it, that was that was quite the experience. And another, probably the greatest, I'll just jump to this right now. My my favorite concert that I ever went to was in 2017 when Veronica and I went to the, it's, it was called the Scotiabank Arena. It's called, uh, wait, or is it called the Scotiabank Arena now? It's called that now. It was called something else. Air before. Canada Center. Air Canada Center, sorry. When we went to the Air Canada Center and we saw Arcade Fire, I love that show so much. And um, it was probably during the everything now. Everything now, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. It was, oh, it would have no, it would yeah, yeah. It is. They played, and this is funny. You can even bring up this playlist. At the time, I remember the experience so much that I later on went home and went on my Apple Music and played. I literally just clicked and drag and made the exact same playlist. I just remembered it verbatim. I was like, how do I remember twenty songs in a row? Because today know. I probably won't remember it at all. But I, I will say this: they did not play "Keep the Car Running." That was the only track well, that I knew. Well, because they're trying to be environmentally friendly. They leave it in the garage. <laughs> they play Neon Bible. I remember that. Oh, let me see. Uh, November 4th? Yes. Infinite Condor. Yeah. Yep. Uh, who opened in front of them actually was uh, Broken Social Scene. And I was very happy to see that yeah, they were there. see, I would like them more now if, you know, they all got on the same page with, you know, you know. I don't know, I don't know what you're referring to. Let's just say. Oh, there's some drama? Or? No, like just, you know. The whole vaccine thing. Oh, I see. Okay. I am. But that's none of my business. Yeah. But regardless, it was nice to see them. I, I'm familiar with a few of their albums. You know, I, um, I would say... I like Feist. The, the, I'm happy she was there. I would, oh, yeah. I would honestly say that well, well, Broken Social Scene, as an aside, Feel Good Lost, not quite the best place to start, but everyone would probably say You Forgot It In People or The Self-Titled is the best place to start. What's the song that has numbers in it? It's like 7, 3... Oh, it's um, Cause Equals Time. No, no, no. Uh, seven four. Seven four. I uh, seven four. Short line. Short line. Short line. Short line. Sorry. Short line. It's coming. It's coming in hot. Love that song. For I'm so reason, happy listen, they played I that. I listened to that a lot in the winter when I was in school, just because that yeah. when, it, when it ends at the end with like it's coming, it's coming in hot. That's that. That's it very, has a winter vibe to it. Yeah. It kind of yeah. Does. Totally. But with Arcade Fire it was very interesting at the time to hear. Like, I mean, I I, I remember again, funeral. Neon Bible, The Suburbs, great trilogy. Reflector. Reflector dropped. Everything now dropped. We picked it up a little bit, but... We is know. actually not bad. The it's second bad, half of it's I'm good. Just, maybe I'm just kind of over it. Maybe just because I found out Will Butler left like a week yeah, or two before it came out. right, right. So I already had the idea, but... I, I, unconditionally and the lightning, I mean... It's kind of I've weird. The, the, light, the, lightning, the lightning almost could have just been one song. I don't know why there's part one and two. Uh, but unconditionally, the second half of Wii was actually not bad. 
uh, everything now, I kind of chalked it off as a, it felt like almost like a parody of like consumerism and like mainstream I mean, yeah, music. Yeah, it is, but also, but it's, I, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, yeah. Tomas Bengalta from uh, Daft Punk, I believe, uh, co produced it. I think so, maybe. I'm like, we'll see. We couldn't get another Daft Punk record before they broke up, but we got mm. like have some Daft Punk influenced production on certain records. But dude, they had, we had great seats crystal ball right above us it was just a great time i lost my voice because i sang at the top of my lungs by the time we got to wake up like we're screaming at the oh, top yeah. of our lungs ah, like gone well that would wake anybody up gone totally gone by the end of the night oh my I'm god looking through here and and it was such an amazing no cars go ready to start sprawl two some keep the car running is not on there they played no, they played every viable. single every single like deep cut they had oh well, well, dude again. neighbor neighborhoods three powers out was a loud track that they played live that was great that was a great oh, experience but the only song that i remember that like they didn't play like a, a single or a great deep cut that fans would know it's just i think keep the car running was the only song that i'm like ah you could have thrown that in but i think i've not listened to any of the records in full right now i'm still sort of like Getting back into music away in a way, doing that again. Regine but, had a really nice energy when she was performing. I feel like she has a lot of uh, consistently good energy live. Yeah, totally. I mean, even now. I really that liked was great. it. It sounds great, I should say. Yeah. Um, that was 2017. Funny, Veronica and I were kind of on a streak. We saw Arcade Fire in 2017, Vance Joy in 2018, and then... Actually, I'll save my last concert that I've been to the state for last. But uh, are there any other kind of like I have noteworthy a ones? More. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. Lay them so on. So, for probably a period of a good, well, it's almost ten years at this point. But I started following this thing called the Polaris Music Prize. Uh, really, in about late 2013, uh, I watched. I've been watching it online most of the years that I sort of watch it. I don't really count it as live, but I was gonna go in 2015. Um, that was the year that like the self-titled Always record and uh, I think Goon by Tobias Jessel Jr. and a couple of others were shortlisted but I had actually already bought a ticket but uh, I guess I had the intention of seeing it with my I guess now ex at the time but I uh, decided not to for one reason or another but you know I watched it live so it didn't matter yeah there was self-titled Always there was Deep in the Iris by Braids Our Love by Caribou a Pink City by Jennifer Castle and uh some other great records on there, but I tried going again in 2017, and I ended up actually uh, having one of my cousins come with. He was a little bit older. I had no idea, you know, how into or not into any of these particular uh, records that, it, whether he was or not, but it, it was sort of like the, I'd say the peak of, you know, me really being into a lot of uh, more independent music here, and I had started doing journalism at the time. I had started really being involved there, but like, to hear live versions of songs from like uh, Retribution by Tiny Tagok, that record, the self-titled Wee's record, uh, You Want It Darker from Leonard Cohen, which was really great, Secret Path by Gord Down. It, just, it felt like a lot of that night, like seeing that live. I mean, my cousin, I don't know if, I don't think he got it as much as I did, but like seeing some of the, the live performances, like there was a lot of artistry and there was a lot of time put into those and it was great. And basically it's at this place called Carlu, which is on College Street, so... The general admission tickets, you go up to the upper venue, and I always tried to get a seat like right near the balcony area because that's the best part to see that. I would, uh, two years later, when Money and I went, uh, it's more like first come, first serve, so I would get there early enough to get those, but it was always kind of cool to uh, go and just sort of feel like you were caught up in a lot of cultural moments. And the winner that year was actually uh, Lido Pimienta's La Papesa, which had some really great moments on there, and it was neat to sort of, again, like how you were seeing the anti queens break out in front of you a lot of seeing a lot of Polaris performances in general is kind of like seeing the best of what's next I see. in certain genres in Canada sort of so you're kind of where... around when they were in their early stages kind of figuring themselves out in a way kind yeah. Of, yeah i mean i feel like polaris music prize for those who don't know is an annual music prize given out to the best canadian record regardless of sales or or, or any sort of like popularity based thing it's it's strictly on an artistic merit and it's voted on by all these journalists and bloggers and those kinds of types i wouldn't say it's hipster per se but there does tend to be more of an underground leaning but so the first time i went which was ironically a couple months before i met my wife mm -hmm. um that was that was fun and then two years later 
Marnie and I went, and that year was pretty great as well. I'd say almost all the records on there were ones that I either enjoy or absolutely love. Uh, there was Trap Line by Snotty Nose Reds Kids, which I I had reviewed it earlier that year, and at this time I was running for like two publications, and I had started getting Marnie into a lot of the records that I was sort of coming across, so we listened to Trap Line. I also really loved uh, Shad's A Short Story About a War. That was a nice conceptual hip-hop record. Um, Morbid Stuff, which I've talked about Pup on a previous albums episode. Um, I obviously wanted to headbang a little bit more than I could because <laughs> I had to keep, stay seated, but they did a full-blown meltdown live, and that was that was a great song from the record, and so nice. I actually hear it live. And then they did a little bit of... Um, no, when they do it live, sometimes they do a little bit of an interpolation of War Pigs from Black Sabbath, but they didn't do it there. I just wish that part went on longer. Uh, yeah, uh, Marie Davidson did a great uh, sort of DJ set with uh, work and a couple of other tracks from Working Class Woman. Well, uh, I'm having a feeling this is like reminding me of like, like you'll be aware of this kind of type of festivals if it's on like the TTC where you see like tons of bands yeah, written down. It's kind of like I'm getting that. vibes out of I that. Mean, yeah, again, yeah. their presenting sponsor is CBC Music. It's been that way since like 2015. Right, so, right, right, you know, right. Having the nation's biggest public media corporation to promote your stuff and air it when it doesn't hurt. Well, shit, yeah. good for you to have like some local shout outs, smaller stuff like well, that. It, yeah. The idea is it's trying to cover stuff from all across the country, but mm. it ends up being predominantly Ontario and Quebec. But there's some pockets of the West Coast and Atlantic Canada and the prairies in there as well but yeah it's hard to be like super diverse all the time but some of the bigger surprises okay one of my favorites the uh the what ended up winning was Hawaii Mighty's 13th floor and Hawaii has gotten a lot bigger in the last couple of years but where sorry um Hawaii Mighty so it's called 13th floor is Hawaii Ma- oh is that a place or is that a bit? no she's a rapper oh sorry I thought you were talking about a place <laughs> no no sorry no. Okay. but uh I had heard I had listened to that record quite a bit leading up to it and then I got Marnie into it and I thought it was either going to be 13th Floor or Trapline that would win that night. But after seeing Havaya's performance, like she absolutely killed it. I'm like, okay, that's winning. That was such a good live performance. And cool. I mean, it never, it doesn't hurt to be right. But that was one where like I wanted to get a physical copy of that as soon as I could. Of course, early 2020, they actually do announce, a, I think late 2019, early 2020, they have physical copies. I think she put them out on her band camp. So I got that. Of course, that was a few months before everything happened but that was one of the mm-hmm. last like big things that um that we did before before COVID hit but it was a really nice surprise for Marnie as well to see that there's like some jazz representation because one of the shortlisted records which we saw her perform uh, Dominique Fizame with Stay Tuned like she's a really great singer and it sort of helped connect some of our worlds because Marnie's always been big into jazz and I've kind of felt like it was a genre that's not always represented in these kind of lists but then there's kind of the more wacky, well, not wacky, but the more avant-garde experimental stuff like Fet Nats Le Mal. That was, I don't quite know how to describe it, but there's like saxophone on there. It's kind of like a bit of spoken word with a little bit of more of like a, God, I can't describe it other than you should try listening to it and then let me know what you think. Do you mind actually sending me like a kind of a compilation of all the best bits of everything you just said? I'll, I'll try Do you to. mind? I'll I don't know if that's thriving. challenging. I've got a couple more, but I've got to remember some of them. Maybe send it on Spotify, maybe, if you have that. I mean, like, Spotify or yeah. Apple Music, I can put yeah, together please, a list. Please. I'll like, try to. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to branch off. I feel like I'm in this bubble right now where all I'm listening to is just stuff I've listened to throughout the past I mean, five kind of, or I'm, so years. Ever like, since like last spring, I've kind of rebooted my brain in a way where I'm kind of like that too. I, I feel like you hit sometimes with music slumps. I hate when that happens. Yeah, I feel like it's been a wall really since, yeah. like the, since the summer of the pandemic. You know what's funny? I didn't even think about talking about this, but I just remembered something because you're reminding me of kind of like local stuff. I'm not really used to like seeing like concerts that were like kind of like what you said where it's just up and coming people from from well, like say it's in windsor it but depends, it was really because it's like it's voted yeah. on by a bunch of different people so sometimes it can be newer artists sometimes it can be consistently good oh sure ones it, sure. it really depends on the year to be i honest. just i sort of come from like windsor where we had a lot of like local cover bands like really good professional cover bands and i gotta tell you this funny story so I saw a concert, two concerts actually, the same night. It was um, Windsor is known for having like their famous like you know end of the year like end of June firework you know show where it's on the D- Detroit River where yeah. you got the boats, tons of fireworks. Uh, you can see the Detroit River and all that. It's it's sometimes broadcasted. And people jump sharks. No, no, you're in that river, you're gone. Like that, it's deep. <laughs> it's very deep. Um, I was there on Riverside Drive, right at the harbor front seeing 
a concert that was just on like you know like those concrete stages that are kind yeah. of built in yeah. yeah i saw one that was uh a cover band of sticks and um steve miller's band oh steve miller oh, that's an interesting dad rock combo and funny enough so my mom for years has always had this friend named mark always talked about this guy named mark he was in a kiss cover band when she was like my mom has seen kiss in concert seven or eight times growing up by the way oh, she good. loved a well, a well army member then and and uh, her friend mark was lance stanley in this cover band and funny enough my uh my uh janitor in my first grade school mr mo who was like the nicest guy ever he was gene simmons didn't have the tongue but you know he, he he had the persona i guess but funny enough mark was at this concert at the this motley crew concert like this cover band and he was playing I don't know if it was Vince Neil or if it was Nikki Six. I can't remember who he was playing, but I was right there, and my mom knew that Mark was playing there. I was with my parents and a few of their friends, and she was like, "Oh, Mark," and I'm like, "Oh, Mark, this guy that you always talked about is is playing. That's so great." So I walked up to the stage, and they're playing great, right? There's like about 20 people there. Eventually, it started to expand to like 30 or 40, mm -hmm. but the funny thing that happened was. There was this girl in the distance front center, and I'm in like the left uh, center stage, and it was probably one of the cutest girls I had ever seen in my life at that time, right? And I couldn't keep my eyes off of her. I'm trying to watch the show, but I'm glancing over every so often, like, my God, this girl is freaking cute. And then the show goes on. Awesome show. Motley Crue, you know, just whatever. Um, and then uh, the show's over, and I call over Mark. I'm like, hey, Mark, Mark, come over here. And he kind of walks over and he bends over. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, hey, I'm Stacy's son. And I point over to my mom and he went, oh my God, I haven't seen you since you were like a baby. How you doing, man? He was the nicest guy ever. And then he's like, oh, it's so funny. My daughter's here as well. He points over. I knew it. And it's, it's the fucking girl I've been I eyeballing. That's why that story was going. Yeah, I was like, oh my God. And then I was in, internally going like, oh my God, keep it together. Could we keep it together? Kobe, and he goes, who's that? Then we got Corey. We got Kobe. Kobe. No, Cody. Kobe. Oh, no, keep it together. Keep your coping skills. Oh, coping. Coping. And then he goes, all right, see Oh, you. coping from the 2000s. All right, good to see you, Cody. Goodbye. I'm like, goodbye, future in-law. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that, but that was that was a very funny occurrence. Um... <laughs> Cody McDonald's family jewels. <laughs> yeah. I just thought that was so funny. And oh, in man. hindsight, actually, she was pretty like... Uh, like she had her hair permed it was very 80s she was probably there to kind of support her dad in wow. hindsight yeah like it was it you was remember pretty my funny. dad the rock star my dad the rock star that was the cartoon that was like executive produced by gene simmons about this kid whose dad's a rock star that looks like gene simmons like, no i don't remember that it was, it was on teleton it was a thing it, oh, okay your story kind of reminded me of that funny that's funny um i got a couple more like, yeah yeah go ahead good so well the fascinating thing about polaris really to sort of uh ending on a good note it was what really sort of opened me up to like, you know, a lot of indigenous artists across the country and a lot of the issues that are in that sphere of Canada that are not really being addressed. Sure. So it, yep. did, and it, yep. it did help to sort of politicize things in a way that, you know, it wasn't always overly blunt about it, but it may, it helped me make sense of it. Yeah. So, it, I mean, I feel like that is more focused now with, with that. But after 2019, I was kind of like, Obviously, they haven't had any galas until well, this year, but I'm not really going to go. It's more of a price thing for me. But ironically, a few I think the weekend of that same week that that 2019 gala was. So I have done some street team work for the last couple of years. Obviously, not really since uh, the pandemic started. But what do you call it, sir? It's uh, street team work. So basically, uh, there's a. Uh, I think I talked about Royal Mountain Records before on some of the. Other, so to speak, music episodes. Thank you. Said that. Yeah. So yeah. I've been doing some street team work for them. Like I hung up some posters around downtown for uh, this Orville Peck record that okay. came out in the spring of 2019. And so it was late September of 2019. They were having this barbecue thing. They called it a goodbye to summer barbecue, where they had like they had merch for sale, I think. But it was like they had all these other vendors, and there was like you know they had hot dogs, they had a bunch of bands playing, and. They were also accepting donations to their recently formed mental health initiative, which was like a, a first at the time because I don't think any other labels in Canada are doing anything like that, which is really great. And they had a bunch of different acts there, but so I was doing street team stuff for that. So I actually helped with like a few of the stage, like the, the crew there, set up the little small stage and get stuff actually set up. So 
I was on the bus at about 7 or 7.30 in the morning as the sun was coming up. And I came back at about 7 p.m. when the sun was coming down. But in between, it was pretty cool. So I got there. I mean, on hindsight, I should have put more sunscreen on because I was pretty... My neck was pretty done at the end of the day. But it was fun. It was a lot of work. I don't know if I would do it again anytime soon, but it was neat, you know, getting to see what the space was like, the sort of alley kind. It wasn't an alley, but it had a lot of gravel on the ground, like picture you know, a, a park area with, you know, there are sometimes trailers, but there's like picnic benches. Yep. Kind yep. of that sort of vibe, but there were obviously booths around and there was other yep. sorts of things. And Indy 88 was there. They were the presenting sponsors. So you had Lana and Brent. I don't think either of them are going to hear this, but shout out to them. Uh, they were the, sort of the hosts for it. And it was neat to sort of get to know some of the crew people because I'm very much behind the scenes person. Yeah, I was about to say that you're kind of getting the taste of that. Yeah, yeah. getting to like actually be in the actual office yeah. part, which is kind of cool because I had like I had seen it before seen the through process. social media, but I'd yeah. never actually seen the building, so I got to keep my stuff around. Oh but, man, like, I'm so happy you're bringing this up. I this got, is something I didn't expect. I know. I was, yeah. I was waiting for you're going right deeper I mean, than live I concerts. I wanted to do music industry stuff, but this is like another side of it where you actually help put it together, and then you get to see the fruits of that labor. So. I got to meet a couple of other people that work at the label, like the managers and uh, other, like the managers of some artists and other people got to go in the office and, and see some stuff. And then actually seeing the setup process for, like I did some heavy lifting of like amps and on the stage and setting up the drum set for bands. But the um, the lineup was pretty solid. Um, the It didn't start till noon, but then uh, this band Four Keeps started around one o'clock that afternoon. They were pretty solid. Um, I don't know if they've done anything since then, but the stuff that I heard was was pretty good. Okay. I thought like, well, if they if it has some polish, it could have been on the radio in like another six months or so. I, I think they're probably still doing stuff. And then uh, Deanna Petkoff was a new and all. Most of these were like half an hour sets, and then it was like 40, 45 in the end. But Deanna Petkoff was after. Uh, her band was pretty good. Again, a lot of the same kind of vibe going, but. Um, she actually put out, I think, her first proper record a few months ago. I think it's uh, To Hell With You, I Love You. I haven't heard it yet, but it's got a, a lot of Royal Mountains indie acts are the same sort of like almost jangly sort of shoegazy indie rock at times or certainly indie rock leaning. Uh, and then at three, I saw Little Junior again. Little Junior, okay. And they were, they were good. Um, and uh, their, for, their former guitarist, uh, Lucas, came back to do some songs with them because when we saw them the first time the year before, he was still in the band at the time, but... I think he had left around then. Mm. And like in between, you know, I'm uh, sort of moving around. I'm having, I had a bunch of hot dogs that day. <laughs> um, and actually, I I remember, so I made some friends. I think someone there that like she's going on, she's gone on to do some stuff in the industry. And the other uh, street team people that I was with, they were they were pretty nice people. Um, so the guy that, that was like, I think, uh, ran, running the hot dog stuff, I think that was where also where the donations were. And I gave him a 20 because I thought, you know what? That would have gone towards me getting a record from here anyways, but I figure it could go to a good cause, so I would want mm. to help. So they were cool about that. And then the neat part was when NMON came on. They're sort of like a synth pop kind of electro group from, a, I believe, somewhere in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And that was when it was just kind of like, I mean, I was still moving around. And I could go in the office and just sort of like do stuff, which was great because like I, I, it gave me that freedom of, you know, if it's a bit too much and I just need to like decompress a little, yep. I could go inside and I will probably show this to you after we're done recording, but um, I know it's on my Twitter. I took a picture of, so there's a little opening from like the second floor where there's like the actual office area where like all their desks are and they're like, there's some records on the wall of like extra inventory, but there's like a little window section where it opens up. And, like, people can actually sit up there and, and watch, watch the stuff that's going on. That's out. cool. And I took a, a full, like, picture of the stage, of, like, of the view out, really. It was, like, so Anamon's performing on the bottom part. Then there's actually a sort of view of, like, there's a bit of the horizon in the background. There's people hanging out and watching. There's the different booths. And so that was a real perspective of, like, wow, this is, this could be every day for me. Or at least that's what it could have been. Yeah. And it was I think Beat My Distance was the their first record of the record they were um, pr promoting at the time, and that was some good some good stuff. And then I think the last band I was there for was um, I had left probably just as Fast Romantics were starting, uh, and uh, Menno from Colorado actually joined them near the end for uh, of their set, and that was good. I I sort of vaguely heard of them. I can't really recall anything in particular. And then Home Shake played at the end, but I think I left for that. But I actually remember 
Uh, I think all the guys from Colorado were there, or at least some of them were, because I saw Jake the drummer, so that was kind of cool. Just a lot of it is putting faces to names of people mm -hmm. I was somewhat familiar with. Like I had um, uh, one of the people at the label, uh, Connor, that I that I think I'm somewhat somewhat good friends with or good acquaintances with. I got to finally talk to him after like a few months of like. You know, being connecting with people on social media, especially in the, in the industry, it's an entirely different thing to actually be able to talk to them. And yeah. Like, you know, get to. I felt like I was somewhat on the same level. Maybe, maybe that's me uh, overthinking things. But um, but by the time Fast Manic was on, you know, I was like, I've had a long day. I gotta get home because it's gonna take me like two hours to get home anyways. But like as a as a nice thank you, all of us got to go to uh, well, we got to take a record. Uh, I guess their spare inventory that they had. And so that was our, so was like, thank you, Gift, for helping out. So I think the other two of them, I think one of them picked In a Poem Unlimited by U.S. Girls, which was a Polaris shortlist of record from the year before. I thought about going with that, but I decided to go with uh, Orville Peck's Pony. I had done some of, the, some of the promo work for it a few months ago. I liked it. I figured, why not um, <clears throat> get a copy of it? And yeah, I went back and was exhausted, didn't need much. I think I slept for like nine or ten hours that night but <laughs> it was just an, an example of like if i'm willing to actually go and put in the work even if i'm not a huge downtown person like i can actually help put on a great show and then enjoy it afterwards i don't know if i'll have ever have an experience like that again but it was really fun while it happened so i i have to admit when i <laughs> when i uh asked you to be on this podcast like i'm like hey and I, in fact, I remember it was at your wedding on the dance floor. I'm like, hey, do you want to do live concerts? And you're like, yeah, sure. But you were probably just too distracted. You literally just got recently that, that married. That was part of it, again. Yeah. But, like, I didn't... There, there was a lot of stuff to focus on. Sure. But I did not expect you to bring it to the table, like, you know, actual experiences about, like, you, you were behind the scenes. Yeah. You got to I see, was, like, another world that I, I have not a, experienced. because... I mean, I don't know if That's Evans amazing. told you this, but he and I did co-op at our local television yes. station yeah. around the same time. I think you talked about that before. Yeah, I podcast, did. So yeah. that that was the first instance of like me appreciating a lot more of the stuff that you don't see that goes into making entertainment. I and only saw like a momentarily kind of glimpse at like what it was like behind the scenes of setting up when I went. I mentioned before I went to Much Music for a field trip. Yeah, and I that did was when, too. That was when uh, Judas by Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga dropped her, yes. vid her video. It was like 2011 -ish. Yeah, it would have been 2011. And I saw Sam Roberts set up their, their whole gear there. And yeah. when we saw them perform live, and it was only like 20, 30 of us, whatever, but like it was kind of cool. He reached out at the end of the show and I touched his hand, so can go home saying that. <laughs> and that that was such it was such a different perspective to and especially cuz some of the smaller acts or at least with like for keeps for example I felt like if I can do something that in some small way helps a few other people get into them even if it's just tangentially I'll feel like I I will have done a good job. Yeah, totally. I, I don't I mean that's what I thought when I was writing if I can get one more person to give something a chance than before then it will have been worth it. Did you find yourself like writing out like not I don't want to say critiques but almost like reviews of these experiences as I mean, well I, in your blogs or uh non not necessarily no because uh, I wasn't there I mean I would have you were like, critiquing like a critic but you were kind of like I mean I had my was own, it like almost like journey journey like journey like, oh my god that's an inside joke Ornery. between that's an inside joke between Veronica and I where I mixed up journal and diary journey oh my god no that's a I diary. can't believe I did that's this on the show journey. Oh my god, I can't believe I did this on the show. But did you keep like almost like diaries of your experiences? Um, I don't think so. I think I just took like again the few photos of things that happened. Let me see if I even have anything on my phone here from that. I might actually still have from that time. Maybe I do. Hmm. Well, you can show me them afterwards. But um, wow, I don't even know if I can even top that now. <laughs> oh yeah, here it, is. here it is. So I'm showing it to him now. But you can see this is from the. Let me brighten it up a little bit. From the top level of the second floor here, you can see there's the band, and you can see some of like the, the venues and stuff. Basically, what I'm seeing, my beautiful audience, is that the people in the audience can possibly see Josh because he is right behind this band. <laughs> it was really cool because, um, I mean, to go back to that, there was some of the other people from some of the other bands would like uh, hang out up there because like a lot of the people are friends. I saw a few people, I think at least a couple people from Bad Waitress who were. Again, their start, which they're a pretty great uh, punk rock band. No Taste is actually really good. Uh, they were there, and again, a few other people from the Royal Mountain family. It was just kind of nice because it kind of felt like the most wholesome example of, like, I know I don't always feel like I belong in some places, but it sort of felt like for those, like, eight hours or so that I belonged. Sure. Because, you know, I got there for, like, 
I think it was around 11-ish that things really started to, in the morning, that things started to get busy. But, like, meeting all the people there, and I feel like I've at least made some connections and somewhat friendships that hopefully will last for a bit. And I don't know if any Street Team stuff's going to pop up again anytime soon, because it was like, it took a year or two to actually from when um, it seemed like there might be interest to start. Because I was signed up to the newsletter, and I was, ironically, it started because I was like, I had ordered some merch from them. I had ordered, like, uh, a, a pullover hoodie, or a pullover like crew shirt that had a typo and that's why it was cheaper. Mm-hmm. It said Junction instead of Junction, mm-hmm. and that was part of the, the inside joke. Yeah. But like part of it was more that you know I want I wanted to get involved for a while, but you know when you're 25 and you're you're you've done two school programs and you're not a current student, your your only option is to try and do something like that because if you're not in school and doing internships you're not going to get in totally but I, again i don't know if they'll do anything again anytime soon but if so maybe it's it's a big maybe just because again post covid my mindset's changed a lot on that yeah. sort of work yeah that's a question I'll, I, my that's head a, goes off to everyone that continues to do that stuff there's a question i want to ask you at the end that kind of relates to just you know like how your your uh, you know comfort of your level of comfort is with with concerts but uh, i'll i'll share just my last experience at a concert before the world just changed a yeah. couple years ago <clears throat> uh, so like i mentioned i was on a streak with veronica in 2019 we saw foals I... uh, yes you haven't stopped talking about them <laughs> <laughs> they are fun as i Describe, no fun is fun. As I and eloquently described them, as I eloquently described them over and over again in that one album's uh, podcast we did. And nothing else. <laughs> um, this was around the time they did the uh, "Everything Will Not Be Saved" part one, and, and I it think was at Rebel. Yes, part two later on was released later on in the fall. So at Rebel, yeah, it was. Just, <laughs> I was gonna surprise Veronica for our three-year anniversary with these tickets, but thanks to Spotify for announcing their tour dates on the band's page. Yeah, yeah page, Tech will do that. She 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 found out. She's like, I, I'd rather just tell you instead of just pretending to be surprised. I know you're taking me to Foles. She as I told her, just have that night off. Make sure you have that night off of work. Yeah. I won't say what it is. Yeah, that's that's always weird like, when you have fuck. to when you have to book when you have to like take time off work or you have to put in a request and hope it gets approved. Yeah. Because I had to really make sure I could get that Saturday. This is when I still worked actually at the bank in 2019. Mm-hmm. So I had to make sure that I could still keep that Saturday open because I didn't know if I was. I think I might have had to go in if like someone wanted me to switch shifts with them. Like, no, I have this thing I have to do. Well, I had I should funny enough I should have dipped out of work the next day so we could have stuck around to see the encores because we had to we had to leave. Oh, you, I don't think early. what went down was of any significance. But though. Inhaler played as we were leaving. We stayed around as we were leaving Inhaler. We had to stick around for Inhaler. Like that's a gateway song. That's off of Holy I, Fire. Part of me still thinks they should have a video where that's just like Carl Weezer from Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> I'm surprised they never thought of going that angle. Oh my God, Carl, it, Carl Weezer uh, <laughs> covering Foles. I cannot. There's there's a subsection of memes on the internet where it's just Carl Weezer covering things. If he's oh my God, if there's a Spanish Sahara out there, I might cry laughing. Uh, the last track was uh, Two Steps Twice, which was dedicated to Kyle Lowry and Kawhi Leonard, because that was when the Raptors were in the midst of their uh, yeah. finals run. Yep, that, yeah, yeah, right around the corner, they made history. Yeah, yeah. when we saw them at Rebel, it was it was neat. You know, good prices for tickets, and that's another topic we probably oh, won't get around. Yeah. Let's not get uh, let's not shit on Ticketmaster, I'm sorry. Let's just not do that. Well, shrinkflation but, comes for us all. But it was it was cool. Yeah, you know, like it was a nightclub, it was in this industrial area, the Rebel. And um, was it Portlands? Something uh, like that? Portland. I don't know Toronto architect and, like, I don't know. It was in some it was in some industrial area near the waterfront. Um funny enough, uh Hunter and his girlfriend at the time were at this concert because I think his girlfriend was really into Foles. And uh, when I was like to text him, I'm like, oh my God, I know you guys are here, but like raise your hand. And I, I can see him through like this crowd of people and we're trying to maneuver our way through, but we didn't want to lose our spot. So as the show was going on, it was great. You know, he's, he's crowd surfing and like just they're playing all the songs that were there and we love to want him to hear, we love to want to hear them. Eventually we did maneuver our way through the crowd and got to, to Hunter and his girlfriend at the time. And we were actually like better, better standing wow. where we're at. It was, it, but it <laughs> today of like being claustrophobic and around a lot of people i don't know how that's gonna last but like it was cool to kind of see us like to go from like a venue a indoor venue to a outdoor kind of smaller seated venue to like now like actually like a, a crowded like 
you know, venue and on the floor where it's like first come, first serve kind of thing. Like, yeah. you pick your spot. Great show. Great, awesome, great show. Played a great mix of like their newer stuff and their old school stuff. And, um, yeah, like that was, that was it. <laughs> that was, that was the end of my little era pre COVID. Um, but two questions and then I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call it, but, um, are there any concerts that you watch, say on YouTube, or whatever that you, you love so much, you always revisit it and you wish you were there kind of thing? Like, are, are there things like that that you keep going back to on yeah. youtube or well, or even on dvd if you have like some stuff well like... here's the thing there is there are some bands that this is probably an aside topic that hardly if ever play anything in canada let alone anything in toronto or if they do toronto's like the only stop they do for for various reasons so i talked about maximum the hormone before but the only time they ever played toronto was when they opened for dropkick murphys in 2008 and I wish I would have seen that, or at least I wish if I had gone to, like, say, their show in New York City in 2013 when their most recent record came out, because they're a band that I love, but because of the genre and of how infrequently they play... What was know, the band called, sir? Maximum, Maximum the Hormone. No, I've never heard of them. I talked about the Buiki Kayes in the uh, first albums episode I did with you and Lyle. Mm -hmm. You know, the one that has the Death Note songs on it? H, uh, okay. Yeah, they, yep, yep. So, Okay. I wish I had been able to see them because, like, that's just, it would have been insane, but it would have been a really great time just because it's like one of those things where bands from the other side of the world rarely come to North America at all, or if they do, it's very, very rarely. Mm -hmm. And I hope maybe with if they make another record in a few years, they'll actually properly tour the world, or at the very least do more than, like, one North American date or some sporadic ones, but... That's one that comes to mind. I'm trying to think of others. Um, I got, I got one. I, I would love to have seen Nine Inch Nails. At oh yeah, Woodstock of '94. Oh, Woodstock '94. Not, yeah. not. I, I would go to '94. I'll take '94 over '99 any but day. They <laughs> I know, but like you know that experience. Oh, yeah. My uncle was there, by the way. I would have also loved '99 Woodstock. I he was seen there. They might be giants yet, but I would love to someday. Or Jonathan Colton, because those two are artists that. I've loved for a long time, mm -hmm. and they do play Toronto sometimes, but it feels very infrequent, or it's kind of a ways out there. I think uh, I think Jonathan Colton played in 2019, 18, one of those. I, mm -hmm. I forget if Amy Mann was the opener or not. I think she was, but I think Marty and I will see him someday. I just haven't been big on everything post- I guess post artificial heart, even post like the thing a week stuff, which is from like when I was in high school. So a mixed bag, but they might be giants. They have a lot of, it's just, it's like weird out. It's a fun time and you're around such a mix of old and young audience yeah. members. It's, that That's the experience that I felt. Actually, that's a thought that I said at the arcade fire concert where I was like, wow, it feels like every age, every ethnicity, every ge gender is just around me and it feels so like like a melting pot. Like it truly yeah. felt like a melting pot. Um I can't think of any other concert like I mean there's like some live performances that I've seen of like individual, you know, just like, you know, songs that I, I w would have been so amazing to see like I mean, but that's like a totally different topic, but um, here's one final big question I'm going to ask you. Of course, we're still kind of like trying to step out of our shells because of the pandemic, yeah. you know, like, I mean, eventually maybe we'll get comfortable at seeing, you know, if we just get like quadruple boosted for all we care, like who knows, like, or maybe COVID's that, you know, um, not, uh, it's, it's, it's that suppressed, you know, that it's okay to maybe crowd a little bit, you know, here and there, but like. Are there any bands or artists that you are itching to get to? Like you, like it's a dream for you to want to see them. You 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 want to see them before you die, kind of thing. You know that's a good question because the very rarely is it like I have to see X or Y because mm -hmm. I mean there's the there's YouTube there's social media for that. But I mean I did say they might be giants. I would love to see one day because. I mean, I love their first five records, and I'm sure they would play a good chunk of that. Any band that has such a big legacy catalog that, yep. I mean, I wouldn't say it's like a play the hits kind of thing, but you can expect to get your money's worth in terms oh, totally. of the songs you know. Yep. And then the ones you don't know feel like a win-win. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of this, because I had like one band that I've seen the most out of any bands that I haven't gotten to yet, but I kind of want to end with that. Um, 
I'm trying to think of who else I would really want to see that's still active. Because that's a tough question. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. That's how... And hopefully they don't cancel at the last minute, which seems to be a thing I've been noticing in the news a yeah, lot lately. Yeah, well, that's because positive <laughs> like, COVID cases will do that. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this might be one that, honestly, if I could be around heavier acts more, I would see more extreme metal stuff. I would see more heavy music. Yep. Um, any, a Slipknot show in general would be just kind of like pretty badass. Just oh, yeah. Cause like, not only because they're, they're really going at it, but Co- I've always loved Corey Taylor as a front man. I think just the combination of his vocal presence, but just the energy he gives off. Oh, he totally. always is putting 150% into every performance. It blew my mind the day, and it was a little bit later on, that uh, I'm like, wait, what? The guy, and this was a long time ago, but I really loved the song uh, Through Glass by Stone Sour. Stone Sour, yeah. Love and that, the same person. Love that fucking <laughs> song. And then later on, I go, wait, what? The same guy that sung that song did The Limits of the Dead. Yeah. I did my time. I'm like, what? That's the same guy? But that, it's such a great example of, like, I mean, at least for me, the fact that you can have the aggressive and the melodic totally. blend in that yep. way. And it's all, it's like you can have dedicated avenues and for that. And I hear that. it now, too. I can't unhear it now. It's so funny. Um, That's a great choice. This is, more, totally yeah, this is more personal thing in terms of, because I love mashup culture. If Neil Cicerega ever did an actual live show, I would go to that because I would want to see what he can do in a live setting for a lot of these songs that I've loved for years. If the Hood Internet did a show, because you know, and most of the people in my friend group know just how much I love the Hood Internet. Yeah. Because I played a bunch of their ma- yearly mashups for you and everyone else oh, leading up to yes. the wedding. Yep. I would love to see them actually perform those with people around, and that would be, you know, how like Sneaky D's or those kinds of places have those like emo nights or like genre nights or whatever those throwback nights that would be the ultimate throwback dance party for me hell yeah dude and great. talk about a range of emotions and just excitement of just like oh my god this song oh my god this song oh my god that song <laughs> this might maybe be a bit of a deep cut but i also would have loved to see in their prime i would have loved to see a tlc show or a tribe called quest show from like the low end theory or midnight marauders era because mm-hmm. tlc i really like um i like crazy sexy cool and i don't mind fan mail but as i was because i was listening to someone cover no scrubs or could do it like if blink 182 covered the song yep i'm just kind of reminded of how that era of mid to late 90s r&b especially in the like the atlanta scene mm. it was really good atlanta in general in the 90s you had tlc you had goody mob outcast a lot of those like the LaFace records yep. scene a lot of great stuff coming out of there, and I really wish I would have been able to see Left Eye Spit a verse, because Lisa Lopez was really, really something. Uh, and then, what was the other one I mentioned? I already, oh, A Tribe Called Quest, because I love the Low End Theory, yep. and their energy is just so fun. I would have loved to see what Fife Dog could have done. And, you know, Q-Tip's always been a great MC, and Alicia e. Muhammad has always had the, the good the good production back there with the... Um, the turntables but just to see them i always love how with my favorite records that's really what it is seeing an artist i love at the peak of like their creative ability yeah so like i would have loved to see stuff like that and i'm trying to remember another one i was just thinking of it was on the tip of my tongue but i probably forgot it now Mm. uh mm. i'll have to come back to it later no it's okay (laughs) let me see i'm looking at my uh collection here uh i haven't seen pup live in it in their entirety yet i do want to see pup at least once i would have wanted to in the uh the dream is over or morbid stuff eras but haven't yet mm. but uh they're they're still they're still a really great live band and i feel like they will they will certainly deliver for me it's like I'll go see any band that I'm slightly familiar with or that I love. And I know it's a problem. And I have this discussion sometimes with my I uncle. I remember the other oh, band. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would have loved to see Daft Punk. Oh, yeah. Well, but, you um, know, that's so kind in, of to like To answer a, the previous question before, yep. if I could have seen them on the Discovery Tour, because Discovery rules, or if I could have somehow Homework, been maybe. old enough to be at the Alive 2007 show. The one that they uh, have the live album for, yeah, because though that that's one of the best live performances I think I've ever seen. Or homework too, like the year on. Homework's not bad, but I yeah. I think 
Discovery is just oh sure, Discovery is fantastic. Yeah, it's, yeah, I won't agree with that. One more time is a song. It's just one of those where it puts me in a good mood, no matter what mood I'm in. I think I said that for other songs before, but like I was talking about, if I could see the Hood Internet, that would be a great dance party. Hearing a mega mix of Daft Punk in general mm -hmm. would be would be amazing. Uh, I was just gonna say, like, I get into this discussion sometimes with my uncle, who actually, funny enough, respectfully declined to be on this podcast, yeah, and you sure, were kind of the sure. runner-up. But he told me, "Oh, great! Now, now you, now the he, truth comes out." He said, "He said, dude." I'm trying to explain to him the whole audacity stuff, and he's like, God, "Dude, I'm getting up there. I want to get back to a flip phone." He's like, "I, I, I hate I my mean, iPhone." I you know there are those Nokia phones he, that are like borderline indestructible. But he lives all the way in BC. I'm, I'm like, okay, I get it. But he, he's so knowledgeable with like music, and like he's seen so many freaking concerts that like you know maybe he should write a book he should he maybe on, he should make an audio book and he can narrate it or you can narrate it pretending dude, to be him dude he should he oh, totally should he's had so many experiences but um coming soon from pop talk press <laughs> we we get into this discussion where it's like he tries to push me to see concerts of bands that i'm completely unfamiliar of and just enjoy that experience when anybody who i talk to will say the kind of opposite where they at least want to go see somebody that they are familiar with so I haven't gotten that to that point where like I'm ready and willing to open to see whatever I, I want to see or not want to see, but just if it's a band that I have no recollection of, I don't know any songs, I'm going to learn it. It just feels to me like that effort and that time devoted to that is going to be like kind of a, a kind of a big hurdle to get past. And plus, similar to how Evan feels about like going to see m movies by himself, how he hates that. I refuse to see concerts by myself. Oh, yeah. And that happened once, actually. I mentioned it before. Oh, about it happened me. to me once, too. I almost saw Black Mountain at the Horseshoe Tavern, but when I realized it was just me and it was going to be late, at, super late at night at 2.30 in the morning, and I met Spadina and Queen. Fuck that. Like, I'm not coming out of there alive, right? And, yeah, whatever. I almost saw... Always the optimist view. I, I almost saw Elliot Brood, but, it, you know, that was a bad date gone wrong. We didn't even end up seeing it. But... Two concerts that will definitely be on the horizon for me in my life. Uh, I already talked to Veronica, and even though her comfort level of seeing concerts is not really up to par right now, I told her, if Bonnie Bar comes, would you go? <sighs> Can't be one music-related episode with you bringing up Justin Vernon. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but like she, I, I, we have to. I, I'd love to go see him, and she wants to see him play uh, Blood Bank and Skinny Love, so it's going to be a win-win. But I take everything back about what I just said. I will, my dream concert, my dream concert, and it has to be soon, especially of what's going on with this band in the UK right now from the whole, uh, you probably know where I'm going with this, but with Eddie Vedder's voice getting affected Oof. by the heat wave that just happened just oh. now. My dream concert, I will see, I will pay $500, $700, 800 to see Pearl Jam live, even if it's by myself. I have always wanted to see Pearl Jam. Like my uncle will be like, "Yo, Pearl Jam! Do they just release? Their, they're releasing their uh, uh, tickets for tomorrow." Uh, or they say, you know, one time he said, "In an hour, Pearl Jam tickets go on sale." And I went, "Okay, I'll check it in two hours." And he went, "Oh, well, you're not seeing Pearl Jam then, because <laughs> they, they well, sell out that, that fast." Well, yeah, it's still like, ironic that they were like lobbying against Ticketmaster being the oh yes. primary, like yep. the main authority. And then basically it was all for naught because it still ended up happening anyways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can't beat them, join but them. I've always said per Pearl Jam. Would I think just yeah, be Pearl Jam is one of those those live oh bands God. that are good in just about any venue, but they usually play baseball stadiums now. Like I, I if I see Pearl Jam, I'd be like, all right, I don't need to go to another concert ever again. I've lived it. That's kind of how I felt about Canada's Wonderland. Side little side little story. My buddy Cage and I went to Canada's Wonderland in the summer of 2019 before everything changed. And uh, we went on 10 rides in that eight-hour day. In a row? Barely any any fucking lines. We went on the Behemoth twice that day. Wow. It was a great day. And after I left, I went, dude, I don't want to go here ever again. There's nothing that's going to top this yeah, day. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, this it, was it an amazing day. There's replay value where you want to go and do it again. There, it was such an amazing day. There's no way it's going to be topped. And I have a feeling Until that if then. I see Pearl Jam... It, 
I will be in euphoria if their encore is alive. I think at this point they are one of those evergreen you know? bands that, like, even if the current record they might be touring behind you may not like, mm-hmm. there's enough of the back catalog that you're still going to enjoy it regardless. And, and I've se- I have them on Facebook, and I always see like someone writes down their set list before the concert up 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 in front, like the stage. Oh, of you the know concert. what? I'm gonna and add it's, another one. It's really an eclectic like mix of like everything that they've done from ten to I think it's uh what's their latest one. Uh, I forget. So there was there was the one that has a. It's like an iceberg. Moon. It's an iceberg on it. Hold on, let me. Twenty twenty. Came out last year. Yeah, in twenty twenty. Um, Lightning Bolt was twenty thirteen. I'm forgetting their latest one. I forget. It's like Gigaton. an iceberg. What is it? Gigaton. Yeah. It had Dance of the Something on it. Yeah, there was kind of like a disco kind of song on it, which was not bad. Pearl Jam doing new disco. Very Dance of the Clairvoyance was a uh, one of the singles, and Super Blood Wolf Moon was another one. I, I'm forgetting the name of the track, but um, yeah, dude. Like, I mean, if there's anything else you want to leave us off with, yeah. Um, so let, let me one, know. I've seen one band twice as much as Rush, and but a longer period of time. But so what you had said about you almost saw a group by yourself. That almost happened to me but I was kind of bailed out. Um, Mm. As in a bit of an addendum in terms of groups I wish I saw, uh, I think in the band experiences episode, I said that I, that uh, my old band did a local night at Lee's palace and we were the opening act. Yep. I wish I had seen some of the other bands that played there. There was a sedge and Canyon off the top of my head that I would have liked to at least see in terms of a networking thing. And like, just to see how good their live show was. But again, cause I had, I literally had to, go home and sleep to have my last exam the next day so i couldn't even if i wanted to Mm -hmm. that's a regret more so because like i think i stayed in contact with some people since and it's just more like and uh the right thing to do if you're an opening band is to stick around for some of the later acts just out of out of courtesy yeah and that's one of my regrets that i didn't do that because it just it wasn't cool how much how much do you love to, to be part of or to witness crowd participation and singing along it's pretty, pretty. When it's, it's like amazing. the right song in the right moment, yeah. it's pretty mind blowing. I, I, I love watching compilations of those. They're but, always uh, great. <clears throat> so one of my favorite bands that I talked about that I got into at the end of high school, Jukebox the Ghost. I have seen them four times. Oh, okay. But twice were in person. Twice were actually live stream concerts last year, within the span of a month. So the first time I saw them was with my ex. It was at the now Axis Club, formerly the Mod Club. And um, the opening acts were actually pretty solid. There was uh, Secret Someones, which within a year or two, they disbanded. But they were pretty good. They had a really solid cover of a Breed by Nirvana that I liked. Cool. Uh, and then Little Daylight, which they also kind of disbanded, but two of the members formed another sort of side project or duo, Me Not You, which isn't bad. But that band, I thought, had some potential. It was kind of like synth pop, indie pop, in the vein of churches, but not quite as electronic heavy. But they had a song that is Mona Lisa that I heard that song and then I fell in love with it afterwards. We realized, oh yeah, that was actually really good. And then a year later, it ended up being in Guitar Hero Live or the, the TV mode of that game, like the I guess extra content. And I thought that's kind of cool that this little band that you know I saw as opening for another band a year ago is in a video game that like people are actually gonna experience. That was neat. But then Jukebox the Ghost were on. They were touring behind their self-titled record at the time. And it was fun to see this band that I had gone to know over the course of a couple of years. And a lot of the songs really hit live. I mm-hmm. think they played um, Schizophrenia. They played Static. They played a lot of the stuff in the new record. So there was Sound of a Broken Heart, Made for Ending. Uh, they played The One, which I'm not too big on The One. But that was uh, a song where Tommy, the guitarist, actually switched to playing a, uh, a Hofner bass for that particular song. Mm. So it was like the same uh, sort of model as Paul McCartney. So that was cool. Nice. Um that was also the there was a song Hollywood where the drummer uh, act, Jess, Jesse actually like sings at the beginning so that was that got a big kind of a uh, crowd uproar because again this I was like twenty three almost three at the time and so it was like and then we went with a friend of hers so it was like a lot of like teenagers early twenty somethings mid twenty somethings we got there a bit late but it was interesting to like you know be out front and you know it was kind of like you got the pictures that we took before but. Um, it was one of the first real experiences that I had where, like, I am actually around people of my own age and I felt like, wow, this is what it's like to see a concert in a city. And it was just a lot of fun. And, um, you know, there was some jumping around at times. It didn't get too rowdy or anything, but it was just, 
it was a really fun release and just to see a lot of neat songs that uh, I already liked and just to see them in a live setting made them even better. Yep. Fast forward a year and this is where I got two tickets. I think this is after the breakup, obviously, but me thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get a friend and we'll go see it and have a good time. And this is like, I think, April 2016. But before that, I'm not having any luck getting anyone that's available. So I asked my dad if he wants to come with and he says, yeah, but I feel like part of it was literally because I would have gone by myself otherwise. And it was kind of sad mm. in a way, like you don't want to go by yourself, especially because that was the first instance of where, like, I could very clearly see my exes there with dating someone else at the time. Oh, uh, you don't I mean, want to run into that, yeah. I mean, obviously, I don't think there was any actual, like, notice or acknowledgement, but mm-hmm. it was just more like, uh, I had already kind of had to move on the previous summer, but, like, seeing, like, okay, that was, like, the last bit of closure that I guess I got. But it was a good time. Same basic set list for the most part. Different kind of a venue. A little bit more underground, in a sense. It was the Mod Club felt... Uh, yeah, Access Club now. It felt a little more open. It was just, my dad was kind of at the back. I don't really know if he cared either which way, but I appreciate that he at least, he at least went as a sort of, for, you know, for moral support. Yeah. But I didn't feel I enjoyed it as much because I just saw them the year before. They did a similar set list, although I think they did a thing where they had a wheel that they would bring out and they would invite someone on stage to spin the wheel. Whatever song it landed on was the one they played. If it landed on um, this thing, Steve's Choice, I guess if there was a Steve in the audience or if anyone happened to be Steve that went up there, they got the pick. Hmm. And then there was a Hold It In Supreme slot where that's the way they would play their song Hold It In, but they'd all switch instruments. So usually they wouldn't get very far. Hmm. But, you know, I preferred the first time I saw them to the second. But fast forward to last year and... They actually did a bunch of live stream concerts where they did two. They did one where they played their debut record, Let Live and Let Go, in in its entirety, and then Everything Under the Sun in its entirety. And I knew I had to get tickets for both those nights because I love both those records, especially because Marnie hasn't had a chance to see that band yet. And I figure if we don't get a chance to see them anytime soon, this will be the next best thing. And we did. We got, I actually got like the VIP package. So it came with like a dedicated like Zoom Q&A slash meet and greet afterwards. Ah. And that was really fun as well. Getting to obviously... Did you ask any questions? Yeah, I asked some interesting questions about like, you know, for Let Living Like Ghosts, I really loved the art style of the cover. So I wanted to know what the initial inspiration for it was because I kind of felt like it was like the kind of crafts, like arts and crafts thing for like a grade school musical. Yeah. And then getting to hear the concept behind that was neat. And just to be in... I mean, I had been used Zoom before that, obviously, but just like... We, I added a, I had the computer plugged in with HDMI. We watched it on the TV. Uh-huh. It was just a really nice bonding moment for us. Oh, totally. And she finally got to understand why I love the band so much, and she's getting to see other people and sharing our love for the band. And I mean, I had sort of been friends with all of them in the band since that initial 2015 show. But just to, you know, I I didn't feel necessarily pressure to ask a good question. I just wanted it to be something that I actually wanted to know the answer to. Yeah. Especially with everything under the sun, I talked about it that I said it's one of my favorite records of all time. And hearing it live, even if both of them were pre-recorded to a certain degree, it was it was really worth it. And then the question I asked in that Q and A was, um, what video games I like to play in their downtime? Because I said the, the <laughs> I first got into you guys because I heard that your songs were in Rock Band, and so we had a good discussion about that. And it was just. It was a it was a lot for that time, but I felt like you know it was a birthday gift for myself last year, and it was worth it. And you know what? It probably brings you back to those times that you were physically there, and during these times, it kind of like is all you can really do. And that's yeah. And it's the fact that like that's great that there's that option and opportunity for this to happen. Mm-hmm. So you just got to kind of take it right now. And it was really good because especially with Jukebox the Ghost, I've liked them in phases. There was the the era before that first relationship. There was the era during. There was the one after. But now, you know, Marnie and I can build these new memories, and I feel like, you know, it's replacing the sort of downtimes with a lot more positive and hopeful ones. Yep. And I I kind of want to just kind of end it off with me personally, just kind of relating to what you're saying, like, just kind of being hopeful is that, like, I, I, I know I'm eventually going to get that kind of feeling that, like, say, my uncle gets of, like, yeah. how he just loves the it's like being there and feeling like the, the the music coming to life a little bit more and i get that sometimes i'm just slowly getting there it's kind of baby steps because there's nothing better for me to hear than someone saying i just saw this concert and i immediately go how was it i want to know the experience and they when they gush out about it it's like this amazing experience yeah, like, that you, I, like I want you're, to you're living vicariously through them yes exactly and 
we're we're gonna get to a point where it's like yeah like i mean it's awkward right now and i'm not too comfortable with getting in, in a venue or any in tight venues but like we'll we'll see where life goes and we'll let the music flow ah that rhymed <laughs> well can't get any better than that well josh dude i didn't even expect to go down this kind of, well not even rabbit holes that's kind of like a a, a negative thing but like a, a good rabbit hole of like you brought so much to like wow like you saw behind the scenes you've seen so much of like the independent stuff in canada the local stuff like i did not expect that to happen well i mean i have many different facets of myself and it's nice that they get to come out in this way i'm like a normie i've only seen like a very small handful of like oh i know this band oh you know this band and like you know it's it's one of those things where like being involved or at the very least like expanding your music taste it does kind of humble you in a way because you also realize you don't know as much about stuff as you think you do but I think that's part of the fun. Yeah. Is more just like exploring stuff at your own pace. And that's what really I've been doing since, um, well, really since we moved in here. It's just sort of like listening to stuff because I want to. Totally. Because it does get tough to keep up with things. But, you know, even the idea of having a collection of stuff, I used to get more vinyl than I, like more records than I do now. But now it's become a case of I'll only get it if I, one, if there's a specific like colored pressing that I would really want that I feel goes with it. Or if it's something I actually want, because there's stuff you got to save up for. But T- take advantage for people out there. Always take advantage of the you also might like or things you also might like thing underneath what you're listening oh, yeah. to or well, playing. Or, or talk yeah. to people. People can replace algorithms. You know? Well, it's true, actually. In fact, uh, it was like a, two months ago, and it's funny enough. I just recommended this song to you and Marnie, but uh, when I was in the record shop. I was talking to this woman and she was so nice and when i was telling her kind of stuff i'm into and i said oh i just listened to the new uh sorry but <laughs> big red machine album and he's like oh have you she's like oh have you heard uh bonnie light horseman i'm like i never even heard of that she's like oh there's yeah, some artists I- I'm on getting there on it. i'm getting on it and i didn't buy the album i didn't want to like offend or whatever i did take a snap shot of like what the album looked like and then immediately after i left the store i downloaded it and went on my way listened to that album and I fucking loved it. So shout out to Krista. I think that was your name or Crystal from this record shop in Toronto. Thank you so much for the recommendation. <laughs> that was what I would have liked to do if I was at a record store for a little longer than I was. Because I've always liked the idea of, you know. Oh, I didn't know you worked there. Cool. It was only for really a, a blip on the radar. Like at, ah. like at most six weeks in total. But mm. maybe someday. Two two months kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. A couple That's months. Cool. Oh, my dream was the video store, but that ship is sailing. I thought that was Lyle's dream. Well, then again, people more than one person can have the same dream. Him and I would have been like the next uh, <laughs> Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery. And then they went on to Rodriguez. write Pulp Fiction. Well, that means yeah. one of you would have had to write Spy Kids. No, no, not Robert Rodriguez, Roger Avery. Oh. He's the co-writer of Pulp Fiction. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But no, no, I don't want to make movies out of my garage. What are you talking about? Imagine Spy Kids, (laughs) but like in that vein. Oh my God. Pulp Pulp Fiction crossed with Spy Kids. Pulp Kids. Pulp Kids. No, Kid Fiction. (laughs) Kid Kid Fiction. (laughs) Pulp Kids just makes me think of like a big Tropicana advertisement. Oh my God. Just instead of Annoying Orange, it's like, the orange who shagged me. <laughs> or is it I orange? Oh my god. I love it. Well, Josh, dude, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Oh, my pleasure. This was a, yeah, this was a great time. Finally, finally, you got on my show one on one. Going back to my roots. I love the one on one so far of this season. If anyone out there is listening, I highly recommend you subscribing to So to Speak. Like, come on. Like, listen to our yeah, stuff, we're please. We're getting very close to triple digits, which Come is on. only a percent, several hundred percentage points away from that silver play button. We're 90% there. God damn it. <laughs> and, of course, leave a like, drop a comment, and, of course, I will see you on the next one. And if you do choose to go to any concerts, uh, please make sure to stay safe and get vaccinated whenever possible. Of course. And, uh, well, I mean,. I wasn't going to offer an encore. I guess the encore will be in the next episode. I'd make uh, a free bird joke, but that feels played out. But uh, my encore, uh, I guess I'll leave you all off with this. (laughs) 